Nahum chapter number 2, and we're going to look here at the first 10 verses of uh, Nahum chapter number 2 and see what we can gather from the Word of God this evening. When you found your place here in the book of Nahum chapter number 2, let's stand all who can and will. We'll stand this evening as we honor the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> and if you can't find the book of Nahum, that's fine. Just stand with your Bible open. Nobody will know any different. And uh, then you can uh, you can always go when we pray here in a minute and find it in the front, and uh, then you can go to it, right? So no, I'm just joking, but it is uh, Nahum chapter number two and verse <clears throat> number one. The Bible says, "He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily, for the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel." For the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariot shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. I don't know about y'all, but in just reading that, I'm visualizing that. Are you? Are you seeing that? Are you seeing a military force coming in red with the shields and, and, and the sun beating down on them? And here they come marching in such a way that things are shaking, right? And uh, man, I don't know about y'all, but you can just see this force coming. Then verse 4, the chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broad ways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. He shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make haste to the wall thereof, and the defense shall be prepared. The gates of the river shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. The Hazab shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up, and her maids shall lead her as with the voice of doves, tabering upon their breast. But Nineveh is of old, like a pool of water, Yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. Take ye the spoil of silver, take ye the spoil of gold, for there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. Verse number 10 says, She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins. And the faces of them all gather blackness. You can be seated here this evening. Thank you for standing as we read, uh, read God's word here this evening. But uh, last week we noted, and over the past couple of weeks, we've noted that those who by stubborn persistence in sin, meaning against God, standing against God, make themselves God's enemy. Am I right? Whenever you stand against God, you are God's enemy. When you, when you stand against Him, when you sin against Him, Nineveh was a stubbornly sinful city. I mean, they were just a wicked, wicked city. And we also know that about 150 years prior to what we're reading right here in the book of Nahum and Nahum's uh, tale of the judgment that's coming. We also understand that about 150 years earlier, they become, uh, they set under Jonah's preaching. And Jonah was there. And these folks, uh, as they heard his preaching, they repented. And this was only 150 years removed uh, from the time that they, they uh, repented from being their wickedness. Now they were at that time on the side of God, on the friend's side, if you will. And they had learned that God is a faithful friend. But here we are, just a little while later. And to us, I mean, honestly, when you look at it, when you think about the grand scheme of things, 150 years ain't that long, is it, Brother Brown? <laughs> it's just, it's just a few, right? I mean, it, it, it's not that, not that long. 150 years is, I mean, not very long at all when you think about it. So there are grandparents, there are kids whose grandparents were there in Nineveh, more than likely. That were, uh, that, that, that saw this, or they had heard of this as they got older. They had heard from grandma and grandpa, great grandma, great grandpa of Jonah that came through. And now we see that just in 150 years, everything that has changed and they're right back where they were. Listen, 
Many then, and let's say today, are looking for a one-dimensional God. Explain what I mean right there. They want a God that's all love, all patience, all kindness, all tolerance. But never, never do they want an angry God or a wrathful God. Well, that's not the God of heaven. My God in heaven is not a one-dimensional God. He's not just all peace, all love. Oh, do what you want to. I'll give you a tootsie roll. It's okay. No, he is still the God of wrath. He is still, he's still angry with sin. Amen. God is love. Yes, he's love, but he's also holy and he's also righteous. He does forgive fully and he does forgive freely, but there is no forgiveness. Let me get this straight. There is no forgiveness for the unrepentant. Amen. You must repent. There's none given to the unrepentant. So God sent Jonah and forgave wicked men of a why? Because they repented. Now, since the days of Jonah, like I said, about 150 years have passed, and so has Nineveh's repentance. They're back in sin. So God sent Nahum. Did God send Nahum to tell them to repent? He didn't. He's already given them the opportunity to repent. He sent Nahum to tell them of the penalty for their sin. That's the title of what I want to preach tonight. The penalty of sin. Nahum didn't come to say, hey, repent or this will happen. Nahum came, Brother Matt, to say, this is fitting to happen. You better get up on the walls. That's what we just read. We just told, we just read where God told them to get up on the walls, to get prepared, because here comes the army. We don't want to just run all over you. But I want you to understand something this evening. God gave them their chance to turn from sin. This evening I want to preach on these verses on that thought, the penalty of sin. I believe that we would all agree that rebellion against God is sin. I believe we all would, right? And there is a penalty for sin. Everybody agree with that, right? We know that. The Bible says there is. Here in these verses, we are going to notice what that penalty is for Nineveh. So let's look for just a few moments this evening the penalty of sin. Brother Mike Brown, how about you pray for us? Lord Father, we once again say thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to set under your word. We thank you for this little book. Father, we just pray that you just give the pastor wisdom and the things that you brought to this house. And the Lord just help us to be thoughtful on the things that are said. Father, we just give you all the honor and glory. Amen. As we saw back in chapter number one, we preached for about three weeks, I believe it was, out of chapter number one of his warning to Nineveh and to all the stubborn sinners. It was a strong and very clear, uh, clear message to them. Uh, from way back in uh, Jonah's day of turn, repent, or you will be destroyed. So we get here into uh, chapter number two, and we find that Nahum's message is, here we come, boys, you better get prepared. Amen? And uh, so when, when God gets in the killing mood, there ain't nothing you can do about it. Amen? And you say, oh, well, that's not my God. Then read your Bible, and you'll realize that it is your God. God is, uh, God is still a God of wrath. God does still hate sin. God still does hate people that stand against Him. That is, no, He loves them and wants to, He sent His Son to die for them. But when you are unrepentant, God's not just saying, well, Brother Peter, I know you're stubborn and I know you're unrepentant, but I'm going to forgive you anyway. That ain't the God of the book, y'all. No. That ain't the God of the book. He does not forgive the unrepentant. So understand that this evening as we get into this, there's a penalty of as, uh, uh, of sin. Today, let us hear what the warning was uh, to Nineveh in this day of Nahum. I want you to, number one, I want you to listen to God's challenge to them, okay? Nahum chapter number two, verse one. He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munitions, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. You know what God's saying here in this? It almost sounds like God saying, hey, Nineveh, you throw the first punch. I'm coming down there. Amen. He said, why don't you get ready? Get ready. We're coming down there. Give me your best shot. He's challenging Nineveh and every enemy to bring out their big guns. 
He said, get your munitions. Because here we come. I'm sending the army down. This army that I have allowed you to overtake for all these years, this army is going to take you over. Now understand, remember we talked about that before, how God allowed the Assyrians to take over Judah and, and to, to treat Judah the way they did. God allowed that. Why did He do that? He was teaching them humility and He was teaching them to depend on Him. Why do, why do things come? Why can we not live on a mountaintop all the time, guys? Because who, when we're on a mountaintop, who are we depending on? Everything's good, man. I'm fine. I can get by just fine. I don't need, I don't need anything. But whenever we hit that valley, that's when you find out where God's at. When you hit that valley, you go down that valley and then you look up and there He is. That's how you get out of the valley. is by placing your trust, placing your faith, placing everything in Him. It would, it would be by God sending them down there with God being on their side now, it would almost like take the British red coats of old and face them up against the green berets of today. No competition. Right? Because of technology, because of training. There's no competition there. It's like taking the, uh, the Confederate rebels and putting them against the Army Rangers today. There's no competition. No competition. And that's what God's telling them here is, hey, I'm coming down. I'm sending them down there. Judah's coming. And they're going to wipe through your little town there of Nineveh and all you Assyrians that have stood against me whom I have allowed to take over some things in Judah are going to be destroyed because you have turned away from me. Listen, God has always challenged and defied evil to do its worst against Him. Give Him His best shot, right? Think about this. His challenge to idolaters. Nineveh was full of idol worship. It was full of idol worship. We know that the Lord is not pleased with idol worship. Amen? Isaiah 41.21 tells us to produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, saith the King Jacob. Verse 22, let them bring them forth and show us that sh what shall happen. Let them show the former things, what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare us things for to come. Isaiah 41.23, show the things that are to come hereafter that we may know that ye are God's little g. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Isaiah there is talking about idol worship. God's saying, get rid of the idol worship. He's saying down here to Nineveh, He said, look, He said, you've taken your eyes off me. At one time you loved me. Isn't that kind of what we talked about this morning? Who did it? At one time you loved me. At one time you repented of your wickedness when Jonah was there. At one time you would serve me. Now what's happened is you have forgotten me. I see that a lot in churches today. I find it a lot in our country today. How many times have you heard that the United States is a Christian nation? I stand before you today to tell you that the United States was founded a Christian nation. We're not anymore. We're not anymore. That hurts to say that, but if we were, Brother Matt, we wouldn't be killing babies. Amen. Right? If we were a Christian nation, Brother Mike Brown, divorce rate wouldn't be sky high. If we were a Christian nation, you wouldn't be able to go to almost any major city and find just sin standing on the corners. If we were a Christian nation. But that's not the case anymore. He challenged Satan himself. Remember when God challenged Satan when uh, Jesus faced him in the wilderness fasting 40 days? God challenged him, give me what you got. And Jesus always answered him with Scripture. The greatest challenge was Satan at Calvary. He said, go ahead and do what you're going to do. He said, but I'm going to tell you now, you ain't defeating him. Amen. Amen. Jesus went to the cross. Oh, he, he died on that cross. Make no mistake about it. He died on that cross. But he wasn't staying dead. Amen. Amen. He said, you might think you won this one, big boy. He said, but hey, watch this. On that third and glorious day, my Savior rose from the dead. Amen. 
So God has always challenged those that hate Him. God will never back down from or be defeated by or negotiate with the enemy. We used to tell our kids that. Our kids would try to start negotiating something at the house when they got in trouble. And uh, I'd look at them playing simple and say, look, we don't negotiate with terrorists. Amen. No, we don't negotiate with children. God don't negotiate with us. I ain't negotiate with my children. Can I get a witness right there? Amen. God has never once asked me, Brother Matt, what I thought about something because He didn't know. God has never once said, well, well, you know, you're asking me for this. How would you like it to be done? Never once. No, because God don't negotiate with us. Right? And we shouldn't be negotiating with those that are under our rule neither. Amen. He doesn't turn and run whenever things go bad. He challenges his enemies. They are armed. It's, it's almost like his his army or his his enemies are armed with peace shooters and God's military is armed with bazookas. Amen. That's me. I'm on his side. Amen. Why do we allow, Brother Mike Brown, why do we allow when we're standing over here with all the military force that God has that God has to offer? We've got all that stuff. And yet we look at somebody who calls us a name and we get upset. We look at somebody who, who says something negative against us and we get all upset. Man, God is destroying a whole city here of Assyrians. He's destroying them. Because they stood against His people. Do we understand? Y'all do understand that that's the same God of today, right? I don't want, don't want to get confused about this thing. But if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's for certain that God challenges His enemies to change their thinking so they repent and are saved. See, in our, in our title of the penalty for sin... God shows us here in verses 1 through 10 of the penalty of Nineveh. The penalty of Nineveh's sin. The problem we find many times is not lack of belief, because everywhere you go, oh, I believe in God. Anybody ever heard that? Oh, I believe in God, do you? Boy, your actions sure don't prove that you do. Well, that's a whole nother thing we can get. We may just get there. But, Brother Matt. Oh, I believe in God. Well, that's great. You believe in God. But you don't believe in truth. There's a difference. Amen. You don't believe in truth. But I believe in God. Our, our, our lives do not line up with that statement. I heard a man I was listening to preach this morning. And uh, while I was listening to him preach, he was uh, he was talking about an old preacher that he knew that was sitting at a ball game. And this was years and years and years ago, and the man was sitting down the aisle. And, you know, when you're at a ball game, you, hey, hot dogs, hot dogs, this, that, and the other. Well, the man sitting down there, he had ordered an adult beverage down the way. And he passed the money to the preacher and said, hey, will you pay him for me? He said, not a chance. So he passed it on to somebody else, and the, the, the guy he had it there at the end. Hey, so he passed that down. He said, not a chance. The guy said, why are you being like that, man? It's not for you. Just pass it down. He said, look, he said, my Lord might could come back in any second. And if he comes back and that's in my hand, I don't want to have to explain to him what I was doing. <laughs> you know, he lived his life. Now, that, that's a little, that's, anyway. But Brother Tom, he lived his life in a way that God would come back any second. Let me ask you a question. What you was doing this afternoon, where, would you be happy if Jesus come back and found you? What you was doing last night, would you be happy if Jesus come back and found you? There's a penalty for sin, by the way. There's a penalty. There was for Nineveh. There was for the Assyrians. What you were thinking about this morning, what you were saying, the attitude in which you had this morning, is that where you wanted to be when Jesus come back? I'm just, I'm just asking. I'm not being, I'm not being, not being any kind of way this evening because, Brother Peter, that hits pretty hard. That hits pretty hard. Are we living our life like He's going to be back today? Are we living our lives as with Brother Mike is if he could come back before this service is out? Brother Danny, are we living our life? Will we go to work tomorrow and live our life as if he could show up tomorrow? I'm just saying. 
There's a challenge there. Think about, let me, let me give you this here. Let me give you this. This is just a little story, if you will. For centuries, people believed that Aristotle was right when he said that a heavier object would fall at a greater rate of speed. Brother Tom, a, greater, a heavy object is going to fall at a greater rate of speed than a lighter object. Well, if you know much about science, know much about physics at all, you know that's not true. Okay? You know that whether it's a 10-pound ball or a 1-pound ball, they drop at the same rate. Why? Because gravity pulls at the same rate on an object. does not matter the, the weight. If you didn't know that, y'all can, y'all can tip me later. All right? I educated you tonight. But everybody thought that Aristotle was right. Oh, he's right. This, this is what's going to happen. And, and one heavier object. And so, but for nearly 2,000 years after Aristotle's death, in 1589, Galileo, challenged that false teaching and he summoned all kinds of learned professors to to come to the base of the leaning tower of Pisa. he wanted to get them there and so he took that 10 pound uh, uh weight and a one pound weight and he pushed them off of the leaning tower of Pisa at the same time and guess what happened they hit the ground at the same time both landed at the same time the power of belief in the teachings of aristotle was so strong that the professors that were watching denied their very own eyesight and kept leaning on aristotle's teaching are we not finding that in the church today it's all about what i've learned and what i know it's all about how I feel. Oh, it doesn't matter that I can look at this Bible and see, Brother Peter, that well, this area of my life needs correcting, or this area of my life needs a little fixing, and you know, I really need to watch my attitude. And you know, when I was saved, I'm not the same man that I used to be, so I really need to put away all those old things. And you know, I don't want, I don't think that because you don't understand. I've been this way for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, so I'm going to stay the same man. No, that's contradictory to Scripture. Amen. Our attitude ought to change a little bit. Our demeanor ought to change a little bit when we get saved. I don't care if you're just an old crusty Mainer. That's all I ever hear. Oh, you just don't understand Mainers are old and crusty. Man, I'm, Mike Brown's an old crusty Mainer. Amen. 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 But he still smiles every now and then. He's still friendly. Brother Tom, you're still friendly. Amen. Brother Peter's just a mean old fisherman. But he, he got saved and he's, he's friendly. Amen. Brother, never mind. No, I'm picking. <laughs> yeah. Got him. He knew who I was talking to. I'm just kidding, Brother Reggie. But listen, when God saves you, you change. Amen. When God saves you, the Word of God means more to us. And Brother Matt, we understand there's a penalty now for sin. See, Nineveh knew there was a a penalty, but they didn't care. Man, are we seeing that in our world today? In spite of God's challenge, many decide to just keep doing wrong. God issued a challenge. Now listen, let me say this. I truly believe that if Nineveh would have repented, God would have spared them. Amen. God didn't want to kill them. But he knew their heart was already hardened. He knew, I've already warned you once, and now you're not going to change again, so I'm coming after you. I'm sending these boys down there to take care of you. But we should not have to get, Brother Tom Harmon, we should not have to get God in a killing mood before we straighten up. We might and fail, that's where we get a lot of times. We wait till God's fixing to hit us between the eyes. We say, oh, I'm sorry, I repent. Why don't we repent, Brother Swope, whenever God starts dealing with our heart immediately? When the Holy Ghost of God says, hey Matt, you know that area right there, I want that. No, you don't do that. Next day, hey Matt, in your prayer time, in your devotional time, then you come to church and you hear a message on and you think, my goodness, he got my phone tapped. Oh my goodness, is he, he's listening outside of my window. No, not, but God is. Amen. 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 I've had people tell me that before. They said, Pastor, you, somebody tell you what's going on? No. I had no idea who I was preaching to. I just know that I'm preaching. Amen? And if it hits you, say amen or oh me. Either way, let's just get her straight. All right? Amen. All right? Trust in God's competence. Trust in His competence. Look with me in verse number 5. 
In Nahum chapter number 2 and verse number 5. He shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make haste to the wall thereof. And the defense shall be... Pre Do you picture an army right here being in such a hurry in their haste, being in such a hurry, they're falling all over themselves? Well, Mike McPhail, do you ever see anybody on the... On, on, on the submarine that get in a big hurry and he's got wah, wah. I mean things are going off and they start falling all over stuff because they didn't know it was there because in their haste they took off running that's what's happening right here in their haste they fall as they're moving the gates of the river shall be opened here the gates are open the palace shall be dissolved the hazab shall be led away captive she shall be brought up and her maid shall lead her as the voice of doves tabering upon their breast but then of, of, of old, like a pool of water, yet shall, yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry. But none shall I look, shall look back. God made no idle challenge. He could back up his words. Amen. When God gives you a promise, guys, he's going to stand by it. Amen. God says He's not seen the righteous forsaken nor His seed begging bread. Take that baby to the bank. Amen. When God said that it's not His will that any man should perish, but that all should come to repentance, cash that baby. Amen. Pray with that in mind for your loved ones. Yes, it's a decision they have to make, but it is a something that as I continue to pray, God will start putting it in front of them. Putting it in front of them. You never know. God might burn their heart one day that they wake up and come to church with you out of the blue. Why? Because you have been faithful in your prayers and God's promise is that He don't want them to perish. Amen. God gives you that promise. He's going to stand by it. All the pomp and all the splendor and military presence of this enemy is inadequate to an almighty God. All the mess that Satan wants to put out there, all the mess that this world has, the veils over the, over the eyes of our loved ones, are they pale in comparison to my God tonight. Why? Because my God owns it all. My God is all powerful. Amen. That's the God I serve. I serve a God this evening, Miss Wendy, that I know without a doubt when he tells me he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. Ain't that right now? Yeah. Amen. All the then cutting edge weaponry compared nothing to him. The God, to God, it was a foregone conclusion. He won. He wins. God wins every time. And his competence was not overstated. But God in competent, is competent to defeat and to enable us to defeat. Go with me to John 16. John 16. He, he enables us to defeat our foes. He enables us to defeat Satan, the world, and the flesh. Now, we are nothing to Satan in ourselves. Understand that. We are absolutely nothing to him in ourselves. But with God... He is. We, we can stand against Him. He makes us competent in tribulations and troubles. Jesus said here in John 16, verse 33. Are you there? John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you that you might have peace. Who wants peace? Amen. In the world you shall have tribulation. Wait a minute. You just said I shall have peace. But now I shall have tribulation? Oh, oh I like this. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. See, we are overcomers of this world through Christ. If you're looking there in your Bible and you have a red letter Bible, that is Jesus' words right there. Jesus said, you're going to face tribulations. He said, you want peace? Hey, you're going to face tribulation. Well, Brother Peter, be a good cheer. Yeah. Be a good cheer. He said, because but Tom Boris and I have overcome the world. Amen. I've overcome the world. He makes us competent in all our temptations of life. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Go. Watching these boys up front. <laughs> Aubrey's like, I'm there. I got it. She gets a piece of candy. Y'all should have been quicker. Mm. First Corinthians 10, 13. Paul writes here, There hath no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. 
who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may not be able to bear it. You heard people say God won't not, does not give you more than what you can stand. I've heard other people say that's not in the Bible. That's pretty close right there. <laughs> it's pretty close right there. That God's going to not put nothing on you that He can't get you out of. Amen. You say, well, look at Job. What happened to Job? He let Satan just afflict him. Did it kill him? Did it make him stronger? Yeah, Absolutely. Did it take everything that he had? Yep. But what did God do? Gave it back and then some. Amen. Amen. So don't, don't think just because you're going through a trial, don't think, well, just because this happened in my life, God don't love me no more. No, nope. God loves you more than you can imagine. God's just knocking some of them rough edges off of you. Now, there are some things that have happened in people's lives that I know that I have had the opportunity to minister to that Brother Mike Brown, I sit back and I think, God, I don't know why. But then when you see it all play out, you can look and you see how God strengthened them through this. And Brother Mike McPhail, I can sit back and I see what God's done. And I'm like, you know what? I need to quit trying to understand why. And I just need to know that God's in control. Amen. He's in control. He said there in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you. He said that He can take care of it. He'll give you, he'll give you a way out of it. He said that you may not be able to bear it. He makes a competent, makes us competent to do or be what he calls us to be and what he calls us to do. I stand before you tonight unable to do what I'm doing tonight. If you knew me years and years ago, I am an introvert in every sense of the word. You would not believe it, would you? I've taken those personality tests. And you know what it comes back? I'm an introvert. I'm serious. You wouldn't believe it, would you? Because I don't do this alone. I don't stand up behind this alone. I've told y'all several times, a lot of people don't believe me. They think I'm lying. No, I got a lying preacher, Brother Swope. I know a lot of them. It's nothing new. <laughs> Just kidding. But I'm nervous every time I come to church. I'm nervous to lead music. I'm nervous to preach. You know when my nervousness leaves? When I say, take your Bible. Amen. Why? Because I'm not doing... Announcements, I hate announcements. I'm nervous every time I do announcements. Because I just... Y'all ever notice how I fumble all over everything in my announcements? Quit saying yes, son. You're supposed to say no, Dad, no. But I stand in a place that I don't stand alone. If I ever get up here and do this alone, I might as well quit. Amen. Because I can't. I can't. God prepares us. Second Corinthians 3, 4, He says, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, that not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Who's all, who also in verse 6, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen. No matter what opposition or adversary or trouble we may, and can I just be honest, we will encounter, He is our confidence. Israel has long been oppressed by the Assyrians and many other enemies at that time. And their confidence had ebbed to lower than low tide. So God said in Nahum 2.2, 2, back in your text, For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. He had allowed them to strip their vines or, or strip their armies as you would a tree vine out here. Anybody ever walked by a tree limb and just pulled all the leaves off of it? You bunch of meanies. Just sheer meanness, ain't it? Yeah, y'all have, hadn't you? I walk out here, I see all the stripped trees. But that's what, that's what the Lord said. He said, I've allowed the Assyrians to do this to you. They've just pulled every leaf off of that branch. They've just mowed you down, down through there. But things have changed. 
things to change because God has gotten tired of their sin. And there's a penalty for it. See, we might think that God's not going to come through. Brother Matt, there's been times in my life that I thought, well, I don't know where you're at, but I sure wish you would hurry. Can I get a witness right there? Anybody else ever been there? It don't matter if it just appeared and an hour later it hadn't been fixed yet. I might be, Lord, I don't know when you're going to do this, but you, you need to straighten this thing out right now. <laughs> Amen. But understand this. He's going to come through. He's promised He will. Here, the Assyrians, I don't know how long they afflicted uh, afflicted Judah. I don't know how long they had afflicted them. I don't know how long God had allowed that to happen. You may know that. I didn't study it. I, I'm sure somebody knows this a whole lot smarter than I am. So you can tell me later. I don't know how long it lasted. But I'm sure they're probably like, God, we're your people. Why are you letting this happen? Why are you letting all these things happen? Why are you letting the world, if you will, come up against us? Why are you allowing all these things? You know why? Because they wouldn't get right about their sin. That's another message for another day. That's not where we are in Nahum tonight. He had allowed them to be stripped like those branches. No matter how severely the enemy of our souls may have defeated us thus far, we have confidence that the victory is in Jesus. Who likes that song? Victory in Jesus. Y'all do realize those aren't just words. Right? right. That's what sometimes songs like that, I used to tell the choir that I led uh, back in North Carolina, I used to tell the choir all the time, saying, when you're singing, think about the words. I know we've sang Amazing Grace a million times. When I tell you to turn to that page in, in, in the songbook and you hear it's Amazing Grace, you know what I hear most of the time? This is what I hear most of the time whenever they look, oh, it's Amazing Grace. I know that one. Right? Don't we? We know the song. We, we, we can sing it. And if we don't know the second and the third, which order it goes in, you wait for the pastor to start singing it and then you know it, right? Amen. We're there. You see, we're all the same. We're all in this thing together. Amen. But here's the difference. Brother Peter, if I open that up, and while I'm singing Amazing Grace, I'm looking at those words and I'm thinking about those words. Here's the difference. When I'm singing victory in Jesus, it's not just, I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from the Lord. And he gave his life. Oh God, save a wretch like me. No, I start thinking about, man, I heard that old, old. Do you remember the day you heard that old story? You remember that day you heard that old story, Brother Mike? Brother Reggie, you remember that day you heard that old story? About how the Savior came from glory? How he gave his life on Calvary. That's the gospel, by the way. See, the gospel's right there in uh, victory in Jesus. And what do I have now? Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and He bought me with His redeeming blood. What? There we go. Y'all into it, ain't you? That sounded like they were praising God, didn't it? <laughs> sought me and He bought me with His redeeming blood. Praise God. We won't try it again. All right, because I, I threw you off on that, right? Just, you know, we realized this was audience particip particip participation, did we? Yeah, precipitation. <laughs> Amen. Said you can harm us, but you got to get permission from our Father. When was the last time we thought like that? See, this world, oh sure, it can harm us. Satan can harm us. I told y'all just a little while ago. Miss Linda, we are of no competition to Satan. Pastor Bo is of no competition to Satan. I'm not. But he that lives within me is. Amen. Amen. I can stand against him because of him. Not because of me. Amen. So he's got to get permission from my father. I heard an old story along that, that, that line. The thug come up to a, uh, an old preacher out on the street and said he was going to rob him. And uh, the old man looked at him and said, you can't rob me. Your father's got to get permission from my father. The guy just kind of looked at him and said, man, I don't even know my old man. What are you talking about? I ain't got, my daddy ain't got to talk to you. What are you talking about? He had a confused look. He looked at him and he said, your father's the devil. My father's God. He said, the old boy had a confused look on his face and he turned and just walked away. <laughs> shaking his head like, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> hey, man. Amen. He didn't have a chance. He didn't have a chance. Hallelujah. We must also anticipate God's conquest. Look with me in verses 9 and 10. We'll finish up right here. Verses 9 and 10. I ain't got but about 10 more pages, okay? Just kidding. 
Verse 9. Take ye the spoil of silver, take ye the spoil of gold, for there is none end of the store and glory out of the pleasant furniture. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all gather blackness. God won then, and let me give you a promise today. God wins today. Amen. Amen. We too share that same conquest that Judah did here against the influences of the world. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. If the world wants to do something to me, they got to get permission from my daddy. Amen. You can say, oh, you ought not call God your daddy. He's my daddy. That's what Abba Father means. Amen. That's an intimate name of God. That's my daddy. Amen. Against the tempter. He's got conquest against the tempter being Satan. In 1 John 4.4, 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Pin that baby to your chest and walk around. Amen. First John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. There's some time. That one right there will be a good one. Put on a post-it note when you get home. You ain't got to do this, but try this. Put that baby on a post-it note when you get home. And put it on the mirror where you brush your teeth. Now, some of you brush your teeth like this, I know. But put it in front of the mirror where you... <laughs> yeah, y'all awake still. You're awake. All right, stay with me. Stay. I promise I'm almost done. All right? I was going to say, put it where you brush your hair, but I got several that'd be like, <laughs> I ain't got to do that, All right? Amen. Amen. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good night for it, right? But put it there. Put it there. Hey, mine can turn any color it wants as long as it don't turn loose. We're okay. But put it there. Amen? Remember that. When you wake up in the morning, take that reminder. Greater is He that is in you than he that's in the world. Because I promise you this, okay? And if you've been saved much over 10 minutes, you know this. You're going to walk out your door and you're going to get hit right in the face. Amen? Or you're going to go check your phone and you're going to be like, it's already starting. Amen. Or you're going to go in and kiss your wife goodbye or she's going to meet you at the door and the day's going to start. Amen. Life's going to start. Understand this this morning. Greater is, or this evening, greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. If He's your, if you are His, Greater is that we've got we've got the conquest with him against all weakness of the flesh. Paul confessed in Romans seven twenty four. Oh wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. We understand this evening. We don't have to live in the flesh. We don't. We don't have to live in the flesh. We choose to live in the flesh. Amen. Now, listen, you're, you're talking to somebody this evening, looking at somebody this evening who understands that there is pleasure in sin. There is pleasure in sin. Now, I, I know y'all sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, Pastor, y'all not say something like that. I'm saying it on video. Why? Because the Bible says it. There's pleasure in sin, young men, for a season. But a bill comes due. The bill comes due. You know the best thing? Instead of having to pay that bill, when that sin pops up, just say, hey, nope, nope, don't want nothing to do with that. Make your choice right then to stand with God. Well, I can't do that. Why? If you believe what I just said in 1 John 4, 4, greater is He that is in you, right? If you believe that, do we believe that? We can say, amen, yeah, Pastor, we believe. You'll wake up in the morning and not believe that. Right? We ought to believe that. And understand this evening that we do not have to live in the flesh, but we can live in the Spirit and serve the law of God. 
He also has defeated the final enemy, which is death. You know the scripture well, 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? The conqueror has triumphed death, hell, and the grave. And we have defeated. Guess what? We win. Amen. Amen. Y'all want me to <clears throat> I tell you what, what I'm going to do for the next, listen, for the next however long it takes, I'm going to give you a complete dissertation of the book of Revelation here in the next few minutes. So y'all, or in the next however long it takes. Y'all ready? We win. Amen. That pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't need to know the ins and outs. It's great to study that. It's great to look at it. Don't get me wrong. It's great to know those things. But at the end of the day, Brother Mike, we win, baby. Yeah. Amen. We were talking to somebody the other day and talking about everything going on over in Israel. And it breaks my heart. I hate to see that it's going on. I really do. That's God's people. I'm a friend to Israel. I want to be a friend to Israel. I want to be a friend to them. I believe our country should be a friend to them. It breaks my heart. But me worrying about it, biting my nails to the quick, ain't fixing the problem there. As a matter of fact, me seeing what's happening over there, if it wasn't for social media and news, I wouldn't even know what was going on. Right? So I'm not sitting here biting my nails to the quick, wondering, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. God wins. He wins. He's going to take us home to the house here real quick. Amen? You say, well, when's it going to be? I don't know. But I promise you, as I told you before, Brother Matt, we're closer now than we were yesterday. Amen. We're closer now than we were than I said it just a minute ago. We get closer every second. Amen. Closer every second. Today God challenges anything and everything that would oppose Him in our lives and warns us of the danger of pursuing them. Remember kind of where we were this morning. Who did it? Who did hinder you? You did run well. Who did hinder you? He is competent to carry out His warnings and to fulfill His promises. He has conquered and will share the victory with all, all who make Jesus theirs. You're saved this evening. He will share the victory with you. And none of that does anybody in this place, including me, deserve. Y'all know what Pastor Bo deserves this evening? Hell on my best day. Amen. For in the midst of His wrath, to sin is His grace to sinners. Amen. Not just grace, but amazing grace. It's amazing because of its depth. It's amazing because of its endurance. It's amazing because of its power. It's amazing because of its availability. Think about His grace. It's available to all. And it's amazing this evening because it is free. Amen. Amen. There's nothing I have to do but repent. Have faith. That's it. I don't have to do anything. I get to do a lot of stuff. Amen. But I don't have to. See, that would be legalism. If I had to do something in order to be saved. See, people will look and say, oh, well, you do this, you do that. You're legalistic. No, I don't do nothing I do to be saved. Amen. I do everything I do because I am saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Allow God to destroy the enemies in your life as He did the enemies in Nineveh. Listen, He allowed them for a season to have control over Judah. But Brother Mike Brown, in the end, He destroyed them. He promised to never let Nineveh rise up against them again. And it never has. You know why? He destroyed them. Wiped them off the face of the earth. It was over and done with. There's a penalty for sin. There is a penalty for sin. We saw what happened to uh, Judah. That, they, that God allowed Nineveh to have control over them and treat them like they did. But then we see the penalty from Nineveh of their sin. God destroyed them. I don't want any of the families in this congregation to be destroyed, 
I don't want any of the families in this community to be destroyed. That's why it's our responsibility, Brother Reggie, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That they might have the same victory, Brother Tom Harmon, that me and you got. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed this evening.